Now we want to welcome you here in the Northside Baptist Church on this Mother's Day. I want to say we appreciate you and the radio listening audience that's tuned in on this Mother's Day. Now if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Exodus chapter 2, the second book in the Bible, chapter 2. I know, see many of you, you have your red roses or your red cassages. That tells us you still have your mother with you. That's wonderful. But some of us, we have the white ones. That means that our mother is not with us anymore, but I trust your mother was like my mother. She was a Christian. She loved the Lord. And that means that she's in a better world than we are today. Many of them left a body of suffering and woke up in glory in a, the paradise of God. And your precious mother and mine are there together today rejoicing and praising the Lord and looking forward to our homecoming. I would never want to call my dear mother back in the body in which she left, knowing all the suffering she endured and she lived a long time on the earth. She was in her 80s, early 80s. I wouldn't call her back if I could. I'd be doing her a terrible injustice because she's in the great and beautiful paradise of God today along with your precious mother that died in the faith. They're better off than we are. We're not to feel sorry for them because we're to feel sorry for ourselves because we have a, probably a lot of suffering and disappointments and heartaches to endure before we see them again if Jesus tarries and we live long on the earth. But I've said that to bring you to this point. If you have the red rose or cassage, then be good to your mother, be kind to her, tell her you love her, do what you can for her because the time is coming when some mother's day of Jesus tarries, you're going to pin that white one on your lapel of your coat or your dress, just like I had to do this year and like some of you had to do this year it's not my first time I believe I had to do it last year some of you having to do it for the first time and your heart is still grieved because of it we realize that but remember this they are better off than you are and they wouldn't want you to grieve over them because they're in a better world they want you to rejoice over the fact that you're saved and someday you enjoy them and they're having a good time in praising God while we're still fighting the battle down here waiting for God to call us in due time. Now in Exodus chapter 2, I begin reading with verse 1. I'm going to speak today on this subject, the forgotten mother. The forgotten mother. I'm going to read about one of the greatest mothers that ever lived and yet her name is only mentioned twice in the Bible. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1, There went out a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, 
he became her son and she called his name Moses and she said because I drew him out of the water that's reading from Exodus chapter 2 the first 10 verses I want to read one verse a part of a verse in the book of Romans the last chapter of the book of Romans I want to read uh, verse 13 Romans chapter 16 and verse 13 Paul is writing to the church at Rome he says salute Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine now the apostle Paul did not forget about Rufus's mother he called her even his mother she was precious to him and he said salute Rufus and his mother he did not forget Rufus's mother now the woman I read about in Exodus named Josebed, and her name is found only twice in the Bible. It's found in the book of Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20, and in Numbers chapter 26 and verse 59, Josebed, her name, mentioned twice in the Bible. Now Moses was born in evil times. He was born in the days of hardship. He was born the day whenever his people were greatly oppressed. They had to oppress them in order to keep them from multiplying on the earth. And then orders was given that all the male children should be destroyed. And of course Moses' mother then knew she had to do something about this. And she gave birth to her son who was later called Moses. And when she gave birth to that son, she knew that Pharaoh had commanded that all male children be put to death. But she could not put that babe to death. There are several things about him I want to mention. Number one, she saw her son was a goodly child. When she looked at that baby boy, she saw he was a goodly child. That word goodly means more than maybe that would come to your mind immediately. She saw something in that child that was unique. If there's anything good in a son, the mother would be the first one to detect it. And there she saw he was a goodly child in Exodus 2 2. The woman conceived and bare a son. When she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. She said to her husband, no doubt, we can't go down and throw this baby in the river. We can't destroy this child. He's a goodly child. And we'll take our chance on hiding him. She knew if they got caught hiding that child, the baby would have to die and probably they would too. Because they had defied the king's orders, Pharaoh's orders. And she said he was a goodly child. We must take our chance. They hit him three months. Stevens in writing about him said he was a fair child. A fair child. That was something about him that was different. In Acts chapter 7 verse 20. In which time Moses was born. And was exceeding fair. And nursed up in his father's house three months. Now we find that Stephen said he was exceedingly fair. He saw something about the child. They did that was very unusual. Paul by the Holy Spirit in the book of Hebrews. Said he was a proper child. So he was called a a goodly child he was called a fair child and he was called a proper child in Hebrews eleven twenty three. now his mother when she saw him felt like God would use him they felt led of God to try to hide this baby and not destroy him now this is a very basis of faith because we find that Moses had great faith that's handed down from his mother and they had faith believing that one day they would be delivered from the land of Egypt. And no doubt deep down in Josephine's heart, she wanted maybe this would be the child to do it. And he was. In the book of Genesis chapter 15 verses 13 through 16. Now God said unto Abraham, Know of a surety thy seed shall be in a strange land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and after they shall come out with great substance. And I shall go to thy fathers in peace, I shall be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Now Joseph had knew that the 400 years were about up for them to leave Egypt. 
And she also knew that a leader must come out of the fourth generation. And Moses happened to be in the fourth generation. And when she saw that child, God whispered to her heart, no doubt, and said, He's the one. He's a different child. He's a goodly child. He's a fair child. And hide him. And so they hid him three months. There were two boys one time who attended Harvard University. They went out to hear Bob Ingersoll speak, and he was an infidel, of course. Walking away, one said to the other, said, Jim, old Bob wiped out Christianity from off the earth tonight, didn't he? And Jim replied, my sweet Christian mother is left yet, and I would not give her for all the Bob Ingersolls that could crowd on this earth. He got nowhere in trying to destroy Christianity because this boy knew. His mother knew God. He saw Christ in her and nothing could disturb his faith in God and in Christianity. He had three months of his parents. They were not afraid of the king's commandments. They said, if God be for us, we'll hide this child. We're not afraid of the king or what he'll do. God will take care of us. And by faith, they hid that baby boy. Three long months, they hid him as long as they could. The little fellow was probably a stout little fellow, strong, with a good voice. And he began to make a lot of noise around there. And they knew they couldn't hide him any longer. They had to do otherwise. And number three, she began to plan for his welfare. There's not a good mother on the face of this earth that loves God and loves her children. But what does it somehow, somehow back in her mind begin to think and to plan for the welfare of her son or her children? You have been hard. And so she planned this in. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 3, when she could no longer hide him, she took for him ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch. And put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river bank. She said we can't hide him any longer. But she knew that Pharaoh's daughter came down there to take a daily swim in the river. And she wanted to hide him right there where that woman would see him. Because she felt if Pharaoh's daughter spotted that little boy, she couldn't help but take it up and hug it to her bosom and want to keep it alive. She knew that. And so she placed the little fella in the bulrush in a little ark, and she placed Miram, his sister, nearby to keep an eye on him. Mother said, Miram, you go and watch now and see what happens to him. And the little fellow was there in the river break, there in the bulrush, in the little ark, and he began to cry, no doubt, little tears trickled down his cheeks. About that time, Pharaoh's daughter came down to take her daily swim, and she spotted the little fellow. And she saw those little tears coming down his little cheeks. And any woman that's a woman at all, when she sees tears on the face of a baby, it touches her heart. You wonder sometimes why some women can give birth to children and turn around and give them away or set them on somebody's doorsteps or lead them or run off and leave them with their husband and let them get along the best way they can. Women like that are not real genuine mothers they need a good case of salvation they need God they need to get right with God because if they had a mother's heart they couldn't do that that's why I say they're not genuine mothers they may have given birth to the child but they are not a genuine mother a genuine mother can't uh, see tears on the cheeks of her baby and not let it touch her heart and so even this Pharaoh's daughter Saw these tears, she picked the little fellow up and said, uh, this is one of the little Hebrew children, I, I, I want to keep it myself. And no doubt she walked away those tears and kissed it. And, and then Miriam knew what to do, and so she ran up and said, well, do you, would you like to have somebody to take care of that baby for you? Now, no doubt she believed in praying and waiting and watching and believed that something would be done. A minister many years ago, young in Glasgow, Scotland, Decided he'd take a ride on the stagecoach that day. And that was in the days of that time when they used the stagecoaches. And as they rode down the dusty road, this minister saw a dear mother, a woman, stand beside the highway looking, waiting for that stagecoach. 
And then the one, when they got near her, it did not stop. It continued on down the road and she dropped her head and very slowly she walked back to her little home up the hill. This minister said to that stagecoach driver, he said, uh, why did that woman act like that? He said, sir, said she does that every day. Said she had a boy that she loved with all of her heart. And he became a wicked son and left her and went off to the big city. Said he's never written to her. He's never tried to get in touch with her. And her heart is broken. And he neglects her. She's a forgotten mother as far as he's concerned. And said every day she comes down your way to the stagecoach hoping to get some mail or either her son might be on the stagecoach. And then when we pass by, said preacher sir, said she'll turn and drop her head and walk back to her little home in disappointment. There is a forgotten mother, forgotten by her son. Many of a good mother today has been forgotten by their sons. They don't care anymore. They're unconcerned about them and their welfare. And it's sad. Number four, we see the reward of her face. She was chosen to nurse a child. Verse 8 and 9. There when Miriam went up to Pharaoh's daughter and said, Would you like to have some Hebrew woman to nurse this child and take care of it? And then the Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, go get me someone. And she ran and got little Moses' own mother. Of course, Pharaoh's daughter didn't know that. And she came and she said, I'd be delighted to take that baby and nurse it for you and care for it. And she took her own darling baby in her arms and walked away with it to be the nurse. You see how God works? The devil's always been a fool giving up rope to hang himself. And so there she took her on baby. God honored her. Not only that, in verse 9, number 5, she received pay for taking care of her own child. Verse 9, I will give thee thy wages, and the woman to the child, uh, and the woman that is, he'd pay the woman for nursing the child. In other words, we find that little Moses' mother was put on a salary, was paid to take care of her own child. See how God had blessed and taken care of the situation? And now she could rear her own child at the same time be paid for doing it. Have extra money to take care of the situation. And the child began to grow, of course. In verse 10, the child grew. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul said, When I call to remembrance, the unfeigned faith is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and also thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded in thee also. Now here this child began to grow not only physically but mentally and spiritually. As this baby began to grow physically and mentally, his mother sat down and talked to him about spiritual things. She told him about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Joseph, and told him about God's people and what was going to happen in the future and God would lead them out of the Egyptian bondage and they'd go back to the promised land. She told the little fellow all of that. And she taught him the word of God from just a little child, and he grew. You know, I like to talk about Henry Grady, that great uh, statesman, one of George's beloved sons, um, that uh, was a businessman in Atlanta, entered to the Constitution, Christian gentleman. There was times when he would become lonely and depressed after making speeches and come discouraged. One day he said to his office force, he said, Don't disturb me, I'll be back tomorrow. You know where I'm going, just don't bother me. And he went away out in the country to the little country home where he was reared and to see his precious mother. He was so discouraged. When he arrived on the scene, mother met him and hugged him. And he said, Mama, I, I need some help. I've, I've kind of got cold spiritually and, and I've been making a lot of speeches, been awfully busy and had a lot of pressure on me and I, I, I want you to do something to me, Mama. And she said, what do you want, son? He said, I want you to treat me just like you did when I was a little boy. He said, I want you to read the Bible to me, mama. And when I go to bed tonight, I want you to kneel down and pray for me like you once did when I was a little boy. Now I want you to talk with me about the Lord. Mama said, son, I'll gladly do that. And that night before retiring, she took a Bible down and he was sitting there in front of her like a little child, about seven, eight years old. And she talked to him out of the Bible like she did when he was only about eight or ten years old. 
And then she told him about the things of God, a lot of things about spiritual matters. And then she, when he went to bed, she tucked him away and put the cover up around his shoulders and got out on her knees and said, Lord, I want you to bless my little boy. Bless him like you did many years ago when I knelt and prayed for him. There that mother poured out her heart to God. The next morning when he got up, he could smell country ham and eggs in the kitchen and cathead biscuits. I mean this old kind of country ham, my brother Camel, that would make the dogs howl for three miles away when you moved from a smokehouse to the kitchen. Amen. There he went in and that good old coffee and country ham and jelly and eggs and good old cat head biscuits and mama by his side they sat down and asked the blessing and he ate that breakfast he got up and he said mama i feel good now i can go back and do the job and he went back to atlanta and when he walked in the office the office force knew that that man had been home to see mama you know it's wonderful whenever a mother can lift a son in that respect and she lifted her boy then we find again that he was informed by his mother about God's plans. That is, Moses was. Joseph made his mother, told him so. In Acts chapter 7 verse 25, uh, speaking about Moses, for he supposed his brother would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood it not. Moses knew somehow, and his mother knew that he would be the deliverer before God ever told him to come and lead him out. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing and rather suffer affliction with God's people, than enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect on the recompense and reward. This man knew through the means of his mother's teachings and the word of God that he would become the mighty Moses to lead God's people out of the Egyptian bondage. So he grew from just a little babe he had three months to a mighty giant for God and became the great lawgiver. And God blessed him. He lived 120 years. And for 40 years, he spent 40 years in Pharaoh's palace learning of the things of Pharaoh and sitting by his mother and dad learning the things of God. Then he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert learning he was nothing. And then came back and spent 40 years with God's people in the wilderness, leading them inside of the promised land. Yes, this mother instilled into the heart of this man the things of God. John and Charles Wesley had a mother that had 17 children. She would spend an hour with them in prayer every day, and then she'd take them aside one at a time and tell them about Jesus and the things of God. And she instilled in their hearts the great principles in the Word of God. And John and Charles Wesley became two of the world's greatest leaders in respect to singing and preaching the Word of God. Someone asked a mother one time, a grieved mother, why she did not disown her son. Said, your son don't love you. He doesn't care anything about you. Why don't you disown him? You know he doesn't love you. That mother with tears in his eyes said, my son may not love me, but said, I want you to know I love him. And she held on to try to do something for her son. That was a little boy one time, loved his mother, his daddy was dead, all he had was his mother. And one day she took seriously ill and she died. And the little fellow wanted to put a marker on, his grave, on her grave. And he got him up no wheelbarrow. And finally got a stone that he could chisel and put a mark on her grave. Little fella pushed it and struggled and got it to her grave, put it to the head of his mother's grave. And he began to chisel on that grave. And someone asked him what he was doing. He said, you know, my mother died last week and she's all I had. And she said she would be waiting for me. And that's what he put on the tombstone. My mother died last week. She was all that I had, and she said she'd be waiting for me. That was on the little marker. He'd come to that grave every day and work on that a tombstone and try to deepen the letters and make it a little more plain. And there, some of the words wasn't even spelled right. One day, he didn't show up. And they went to his home to check on the little fella. He's lying there on the bed, his eyes closed. He'd gone on to be with his mother.
Little fella died that night. He grieved so over his mother, he just couldn't live. And God took the little fella on to be with his mother. He never had completely finished the marker. But they brought his little body and pushed, put it in a little grave right beside of his mother. And some good men finished that marker and won for him. Beloved, we need to realize that mothers mean a lot to their sons, the right kind of mothers. And the sons should appreciate and love their mothers and respect them. Yeah. Several years ago, just before my daddy died, he was on his bed, a deathbed. He knew he couldn't live. My dear old daddy called me to his bedside. I was the oldest son in the family. He looked up at me and he said, uh, Verge, he called me Verge. He said, son, I won't be here long. And he said, your mother has been good to me. And said, I want you to see that she's looked after after I'm gone. I said, Daddy, Mama will be taken care of after you're gone. Don't you worry about it. He said, all right. It wasn't long until we buried my dad. My mother be, fell and broke a hip. Many of you know the story. She was a wonderful Christian, loved God with all of her heart. Never walked anymore after she broke a hip. For some reason or other, it seemed to heal back, but she couldn't walk or wouldn't walk. She was a diabetic. And they had to amputate one of her limbs. That broke our hearts. My oldest sister said, well, I'm going to take her into our home. And I'm going to look after mama in my home as long as she lives. The doctor said, you can't do it. She'll have to be lifted and you can't lift her and you can't look after her. I'm going to have to place her in a nursing home, a convalescent home. My oldest sister said, no, I want mama to stay in my home. He said, I, I wish you could, but you can't take care of her. And my oldest sister finally gave in that my mother be placed in a nursing home, which is fine. I'm, I'm not against nursing homes. They're great. They're wonderful for people today. Many people have better care there than they have anywhere else. And my mother was placed there. And she was happy. But you know, my, my oldest sister visited that mother of mine, I suppose, about every day she was there. Every day she'd go see her. We'd go see her quite often, some of the other children would, and she'd always lift us up. And I'd feel better after visiting her than I did. I'd go to encourage her, and she'd encourage me. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. It may come a time you'll have to place your mother in the hospital. You may have to place her in a convalescent home. Or you may have to place her someplace to be taken care of, but you don't have to forget her. A lot of people carry their mothers to places of that type and... Dump them off and forget them. And they sit there with lonely and broken hearts looking, watching that door to see whether or not their daughter or their son or their grandchildren will come in and pay them a little visit. Now, dear people, you listen to me and don't you forget this. The older you grow and as your children begin to leave out and your grandchildren move on out away from you, the more you're going to look forward and long for them just to come and pay you a visit and to see how you're getting along and to say, howdy, mama, how are you today? Dad, how are you doing? But many people, while they're in good health, while they're young and in their youth, they forget old grandmother, a mother or granddad and never go around them, maybe occasionally drop by. Really, the heart's not in that. They could just as well not ever go see them. Those poor old souls sit there week in and week out and year in and year out sometimes with a longing heart to see their children or their grandchildren. And grandchildren and children don't realize what it means to people when they're old and feeble just for them to come by and say, how you doing? I love you. Good to see you. I want to pay you a little visit. And you won't realize that until it's too late. I look back now. I, I visited my mother. I don't regret about my mother because I visited her quite often and, and did all I could, I thought, to help her. But I could have spent a little more time with my daddy, and I did. My daddy worked hard, and he was busy in his business. And I could have gone and encouraged him to take a rest or go off somewhere and 
stay a week or so, but I didn't. I was busy in my work, and he was busy. And if I had my time to go over, I'd spend more time with my daddy. I surely would. And you don't realize these things until it's too, until it's too late. And so you let this seep down into your heart. Don't neglect your mother and daddy as they grow old. The heart's aching and longing to have you to come by and just say hello. Eat a meal with them. Call them. See how they're doing. That's why many elderly people get them a little pet in their home. Then have that little dog or that little cat and his company to them. But they'd much rather see the children or the grandchildren come by. But since they don't come by, they'll talk to the little dog, the little pet. As a proven fact, where elderly people have little pets like that, they live longer. Because it takes a little of their grief off of their children not coming by and saying howdy and spending some time with them. Many times you don't, the old saying goes, you don't miss your mother until she's gone. I miss mine. I love her. God bless her. I'll see her again. She could come in this church clapping her hands and praising God and saying, Son, preach it. I can't preach what you can. I'll pray for you. You preach it, son. I'd go visit her in the nursing home and she'd clap her hands and she'd say, Son, I'm glad to see you, Virgil. Uh, I want you to get that gospel out. I, I can't preach what you can, but I'll sure pray for you. I said, Mom, I know it. She'd praise God and say, Don't you worry about me. I'm happy. She said, This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. Brother, I'd leave there on cloud nine because she'd lift me up. I thought I'd go ahead and see if I couldn't help mom a little bit. But I'd be the one to go out there skipping and praising God because she'd lift me up. And she's in heaven today with some of your mothers rejoicing and praising God and concerned about what we're doing here today at Northside. Thank God for the precious members. Let us all stand to our feet. I've spoken to you on forgotten mothers. Don't forget them. Don't forget them as they grow older. If you do, you'll be sorry and grieve about it the rest of your days. Yeah. Bow your heads for just a moment. Father, I pray that you'll take this message and use it to thy glory. May thy name be honored. May Jesus be glorified in this invitation. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Debbie, play a stanza or so. And if you're in this building, you need to get saved. Or come back to God and join the church. Would you come? While she plays a stanza or so, would you come? If you need to get saved, come back to God and join the church. Would you come? Everybody in the building to be seated except the mothers. All the mothers remain standing. Will you please? All mothers remain standing. Everybody else be seated. I want you to look around at the mothers, will you? Come on, let's give them a hand. <laughs> Amen. God bless them. All right, you may be seated. We have a mother here that's uh, 80 years old or older. Would you stand up? A mother 80 years old or older. Anyone, any mother here 80 years old other than Sister Jared? Sister Jared, how old are you? 84. He's 87. Last mother's dead, 84. <laughs> I had to kid you a little bit. 84 this coming August, she said. And all right, let's give her a big hand, will you? <laughs> Amen. That's fine. Mother Jared, I have just a little gift for you. I want to give you, God bless you. We love you. You want to. Faithful here in Northside. We appreciate you very much. God bless you. Amen. All right. Do we have any mothers here 25 years old or younger? Would you stand up? 25 years old or younger? Sister Peak, how old are you? 23. You're the youngest mother here today. Any mother younger than that? Come on, let's give her a hand, will you? God bless you. Come down here, Sister Peak. I have a little gift for you. 
23 years old. God bless these mothers. Amen. I'm glad God sent this fine couple back from South Carolina. Sheriff run them back over here. No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> I'm glad they came back to be with us at Northside there. But here's just a little gift for you. I know we appreciate you. God bless you. Amen. I love you. Well, I love you in the Lord too. God bless you. Amen. All right, we appreciate our mothers. Amen. She put something in the pot there, didn't she? That's fine. All right, I tell you now, after we dismiss today, I want you to.